Hello everyone, welcome back to theCUBE's coverage here in the New York City Big Apple, here at the New York Stock Exchange. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE with Dave Vellante. Check out our CUBE pod every Friday. We drop a CUBE pod from our thoughts from the week. But here we are in New York City for its UN General Assembly. You got Climate Week, a lot of action around globalization, bringing worlds together, the nexus of this next revolution of technology, bringing it all together. Again, behind me is the, 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 the trading floor of the New York Stock Exchange. And Dr. Ami is here. She's the co-founder and CEO of Open Policy. Dr. Ami, great to see you. Thanks for coming in. Great to be here. So we have the Cube here in New York City. You know, I love it. It's UN Summit. Uh, we just had a fantastic event yesterday, uh, hosted by our VC Litical Ventures. Uh, with the Kroc Institute for Digital Diplomacy. We have a lot of diplomats in town and the conversation, you know, we have a lot of topics, of course, but AI and tech policy, and that's exactly what we do, so I'm excited to be here. First of all, I love the name of your company that you co-founded as the CEO of is Open Policy. First of all, open is a great word because we believe in open source and open media. Um, policy is an area that has always been kind of like a cottage industry, the Beltway Bandits with running things, um, and connecting policy leaders and that world with tech innovators is really what we need right now because you're seeing technology being a driver of innovation and now with generative AI, AI is now coming to the fold where you're seeing the pundits, even in the, the DC circles, uh, riffing on it. Certainly here in New York and Silicon Valley, those two areas are all connected together. You start to see the center of it and you're leading the charge. Um, you're about a year in to the company, congratulations. Uh, business is good. Um, former head of uh, cyber at Intel. Cyber policy, cyber yeah. Cyber policy, which again, governance, this is your wheelhouse. So I have to ask you, where are we in the progress of this? Because this policy has been around for a while, um, but it's changing. So two questions, how's that old world changing and where are we on this new path? So it's a very exciting question because I think we are experiencing the moment. And I like to talk about it uh, in the context of kind of three main pillars. So first of all, there is a reckoning within Silicon Valley, between the innovative communities. Here we go. They're so supportive of, of this point, so we're going to let big them. Big tray just yes. going down there. <laughs> They're also excited about getting connected to this. They love open policy. Exactly, so exactly, yeah. love it. Um, so I think there is an understanding that um, policy, conversations in DC, what's going coming from a regulatory perspective is meaningful, and it's not just meaningful for the top 1% organizations with the large government affairs uh, um, kind of departments. It's important for every founder of startups, of companies that are unicorns. So number one, the policy conversation is more important. If you think about the conversation about AI, what's coming in terms of requirements? How are we going to be regulating foundation models? This is impacting the entire industries. So Valley, entrepreneurs, unicorns are understanding, are getting to the point where they understand this is important. Second piece, the conversation is becoming a lot more complex. We have all these regulations coming in, executive orders, things that are coming from the EU. And here in that intersection comes the third point, which is there is an opportunity to use AI, and this is what we're focusing on with our platform, to take processes that in the policy profession used to take consultants that are all over lobbyists and would take them a lot of time and simplifying them and take the expertise of the policy strategist and train it on the model. So we are excited about being in that intersection and really what we are doing is providing end-to-end -end government affairs value, how policy can impact your organization, how you can be impactful in the conversation, but also take those insights into your marketing and your product and bringing that to the entrepreneurship unicorn layer. And tech is becoming much more involved in policy and, and they've always, and admittedly so, not always great at it. So the bridging the tech leadership into the policy world which can be stuffy and elitism, mm -hmm. is being democratized. That's the theme of AI that we're seeing is that, um, yeah, cybersecurity, the stakes are high, AI is going to help there, but you're starting to see the trend in this new inflection point where the democratization of blank is happening. Semiconductors, more custom silicon, supercomputing is being democratized, data is being democratized, policy and those conversations are being um, democratized. We had climate change and entrepreneurs on talking about how bringing data to the table to give more visibility via dashboards to understand the impact of the, to the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the nation of Wales behind us, the logo on the big screen, that was the big cheer for the president. Um, they're here, it's a global stage. That's right. So all those things are coming together. What's, what's your approach as you look at that narrative when you talk to your customers? 
we're looking to you to advise them and lead them with the playbooks and the advisory and, and tools to be successful. So our approach is to enable uh, the best companies in the world, we work with organizations like Armis and KiteWorks, like leading edge companies, to really uh, be immersed and capture this policy conversation. And what it means is it's not just a consultancy. We have to be using the power of AI to be tracking all these proposed policies and regulation and really connect the dots to what it matters, to what it means from a future product strategy and a marketing perspective. The second piece, which I'm very excited about, is this coalition model. So this is where the unicorns come together and they're actively advocating in the conversation and shaping the conversation. So for all of that, we have come to the conclusion that connecting technology leadership, innovation, with DC, with Brussels, with the policy conversation, needs to move from the consultancy-based model where only large big tech and large manufacturers and big companies can afford those lobbies that cost, that cost 15K right a month. Yes. And that requires scale. And this is where the platform, the coalition and AI uh, are, are, you know, are all getting together. That's the, the idea of the platform. So moving forward, uh, no doubt AI is, is shifting. The regulatory conversation is very dynamic. This is where organizations and innovative companies are recognizing there is an opportunity. How do people get involved? Because again, this is a very compelling story. Your voice is a, a fresh voice in the industry. We're seeing um, the, um, the big, I'd say incumbent leaders in policy. A lot of backroom deals, people are always nervous, what's out in the open. We want to turn the lights on. That's people right. We want to participate. That's right. Open source That's right. concepts applied to policy are coming. How do you do that and how do people get involved? John, first of all, it's a great question because the first thing that I, that I uh, often need to clarify is that policymakers are eager for the perspective of entrepreneurial companies. They want the perspective of those companies. So first of all, it's empowerment. So we at Open Policy are working with some of the best cybersecurity, privacy, AI, and trust companies in the world in each category. You can, you can take a look at our website. Reach out to us. This is our focus now. Uh, we are delighted to be the gateway uh, to policy for those unicorn companies. And I think uh, the pathway towards empowerment you know, that we are really focusing on is not just enabling automations for large government affairs organization, but really empowering organizations that never been in the policy yeah. arena, that don't have the government affairs persona, because most of our customers are exactly like that. So first of all, reach out, be empowered. And the final piece, which is very important, even if you are not actively filing comments and shaping and walking in, you know, walking into Congress, know that the policy conversation is going to be the future of your market. You know, in cybersecurity, CISOs tell me future regulation is half of their budget. So you want to be knowledgeable, right? Intelligence and being connected in terms of your product and marketing is also important. So we're excited and uh, we hope you reached out. Education is huge. I think that's a big part of what you're doing. I'd imagine I'd love to explore that. And two is, is that if that budget's there and the people want to be educated because they're lawyers, they're not techies. Or most lawyers, I'm oversimplifying it, but they're not usually techies. And you're seeing a new generation come in that's more technical savvy, but they need that help. And, and again, one of the things about policy is, is that, you know, I had an old expression, follow the money. That's right. So there's always been perverse incentives with policy, but getting it out in the open with open policy is a good way to kind of get that. Companies need government affairs scale mm -hmm. and tools. But when you look at the follow the money, you know, there's a bigger picture going on here, not just influence in society. If you look at cyber, for instance, ransomware gangs, the criminal activity in ransomware is at an all time high, and that's impacting not only the celebrity status of these groups that are forming, um, and they're, they're reconstituted even, even when they get caught. Uh, governments are involved, nation states. So you start to have this kind of like off book activity. That's right. Money's there. So you're seeing things being funded. So like. Again, follow the money. So the, there is a global issue here. Um, certainly in the U.S., we're on a defense, offense mm -hmm. versus defense, a lot of asymmetry um, issues dealing with that. But so, you know, money's involved, even on both sides, to influencing campaigns, to, you know, ransomware gangs, and even criminal activity uh, from nation states attacking our grid. And, you know, again, this is a global policy. So how do you, how do you te tell that story? To, to mainstream tech, because it's a, it's complicated. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a great question. Um, the number one issue is, you know, there is a lot of translation 
right? There is what the companies are doing, their amazing technology, the threats they're seeing, and then there is the seek. And this, in this translation layer, layer of how to craft the comments and how to tell the story, that's where we have a lot of the secret sauce expertise that we are excited to scale. So that's number one. The second piece is, you know, you mentioned ransomware. Uh, those of you who have been tracking the defense budget, the National Defense Authorization Act might have noticed the Senate had a big amendment now on ransomware. So when there is a topic like that, AI governance, cybersecurity, we really need to make sure that the cutting edge innovation is visible to DC. And this is where connecting the innovation matters, not just for the companies and the government, but national security at large. So this is at the core of our mission, is to make sure that policymakers are connected to innovation. And our number one message to executive is, this is not a, just a non-for-profit you know, non activity. If you are creating a security solution, if you're creating an AI solution, you need to be on top of what's gonna be the future of the market. And embracing it, it's very important to embrace that that is coming from compliance, that is coming from regulation. The more ahead you are in the conversation, the more strategic you can be. You know, the, uh, the, the NIST guidelines and the Open um, Source Foundation for Application Security are two groups that are actually putting together quite good specifications on Absolutely. AI. So, Again, these are open source working groups. NIST obviously is doing some great work around cybersecurity and generative AI. There's now more momentum now for standards bodies. That's right. And when I was coming out of college, uh, the internet was growing, dating myself, but you know, I am kind of old. But standards bodies- You don't show. Standard, thank you. Standards bodies are, were very important to establishing the, the scale and the normity and the, and the conformity of the web. Mm -hmm. um, now we're, and then we just kind of went sideways cloud. We didn't really need much here and there, maybe in telecom. Now we're seeing a resurgence of standards. That's right. What's your view there? Because this is becoming now an opportunity to participate, but shape the future. NIST is just one example, OSWAP, OWASP is just another one. You know, I'm so glad you raised it. We are, you know, NIST is one of our main partners where we fit comments on and partner. We are part of the NIST AI Safety Institute, which is a very important initiative. And we are very proud to be able to bring the group of innovators into that conversation. So number one, regulations policy is becoming more connected to standards and more prescriptive, right? Yeah. So this is where the contribution is not just high level legislation, is actively taking part in shaping the body of standards and frameworks that are gonna be uh, really the core compliance metrics for, for this entire market. So let's say I'm a security company, knowing that the cybersecurity framework 2.0 has been updated. Let's say I'm an AI company, knowing that there is room for the participation for feedback for the NIST AI framework. That's exactly where we sit. And the idea is to simplify the access to knowing everything that is coming, but also allow engagement and the coalition is not less important because for these companies to have one voice or at least a consensus, it requires also the technology and the expertise. And the collective intelligence of the community can really be a mul force multiplier Absolutely. in affecting change. Absolutely. Competitors are coming together because they understand that, you know, if, if they're not there, yeah. it's the 1% that shapes the conversation, so, which is important, but we need more voices. Dr. Amir, I want to get your opinion and reaction to this. So one, uh, around the old way versus the new way, open policy way, which I call the new way, um, is that in the old way was, there's a lot of backroom deals going on, money, follow the money, my friend's brother works there, uncle, well, you know, the Beltway Bandits, uh, as they've been called. Um, I covered the Amazon Web Services Jedi contract um, many, many years ago when Amazon clearly had the best spec for mm -hmm. cloud for the, for the military tactical edge uh, program, mm -hmm. $10 billion. Other vendors wanted to get in there, I won't mm -hmm. name names, everyone knows who they are. Um, and the way they operated smear campaigns mm. and all kinds of these tactics. Mm. There's old school tactics that are out there um, because the dollars are so big, the consequences of not winning the deals, that so the policy can be, can be weaponized. Yeah. So this is something that people are concerned about. So what's your reaction to that? And how does open policy and the open movement open the um, kimono, if you will, and turn yeah. the lights on? Because if we can make it transparent, we can see everything. Yeah. Versus these kind of like weird campaigns, yeah. counter operatives, operative campaigns. Yeah. What's your reaction? To that? Yeah. Well, I think we're really focusing on the opportunity. And I think in this case, there are a couple of things. A, coalition crowdsourcing. 
thinking that one company should go one on one and all, with the government when it comes to a policy initiative is already a type of approach we don't want to take. We want the companies to come together. So already when we come together, we have more power. The other piece is empowerment and just bring visibility to all the opportunities. When we come into government, often they tell us, um, you are the voice that has been missing. So there is openness for the perspective, but organizations need to show up. And it's our job to simplify for them what showing up means. No longer 50 people, right? Government affairs shop to be effective, right? So this is where we focus. And I think um, the number one, the mis like my number one message to the audience is this hasn't, it doesn't need to be the case that only certain groups have access to DC. It's, it's, there is openness, there is opportunity, there are opportunities to comment, and we are there to simplify and crowdsource, right, the perspectives yeah. and making it easier. And absolutely, we are um, committed yeah. to the innovative companies, and we are committed to representing organizations that are leading edge uh, and not necessarily have that, you know, very robust uh, 20 people shop right now in DC, because we believe this is the next generation of the perspectives that has been missing. You said at the beginning of uh, this interview, market impact influence isn't, isn't just about influence, it's about having a seat at the table. That's right. Um, if you look at the old way, the tactics were about extortion, pressure, lobbying. The word lobbying became kind of a negative term versus being more educational, which is the traditional definition. So having influence and a seat at the table is super important. I think people are hungry for that. So how do they do that? Take us through, I'm a company, I'm, I'm in need of some government affairs. Walk me through, I want to have market influence because the, the older, older models aren't operating under open market influence and a seat at the table because that's what the modern consultancy slash platforms are looking yeah. like. And I think it's important to distinguish there are amazing players right now in DC, amazing lobbying firms, uh, you know, we leverage them as well. There are trade associations that are fantastic. And um, some of these big organizations are taking on the hard task of educating policymakers and they're doing it on behalf of others. And they're creating positive external, um, you know, network effects, but um, you know, Traditionally, it was the case, I believe, that you know you hire someone in now, so you need a very, uh, you know, experienced policy strategist. They would hire lobbies that are very expensive, or try to write comments themselves. And it's just hard. It's hard to write the comments. It's yeah. it's hard. It's hard to understand what you should be focusing on to prioritize and how to really think about the contribution you can bring to the table. It's hard to come together. We talked about coalition. Traditionally, those coalitions are very big. Like you look at the Chamber of Commerce, a fantastic organization, but really focusing on the entire market. So, um, you know, what we are trying to do is really simplify all of that and have an end-to-end -end solution. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. So, um, as I see it, I see the world kind of like in a, in a world where it's coming together where um, government has traditionally misunderstood big tech, okay? And big tech has misunderstood government. And, you know, certainly with Lena Khan there, we're trying to regulate M&A, which is causing a little problem in the industry. Um, we're seeing a lot of problems. And so in the tech circles of Silicon Valley, the conversation's like, hey, they'll kill what they don't understand or regulate what they don't understand. So your, our job is to help them understand. Yeah. So being misunderstood is a bad thing in this case. So how do we change that? What, what needs to happen? Is it just straight education? Is it blocking and tackling? What are some of the tactics? Strategy and tech. Yeah, and you know, I love this question. So first of all, a good friend of mine says, um, you know, um, when Silicon Valley comes to DC, they come to hunt. When DC comes to Silicon Valley, they come to the safari, like have, you know, experience and see all. Of course, of course, this is this is a yeah, metaphor. There's, this a, there's a giraffe over yeah, there. Yeah, this, okay. is a, this is, of course, a metaphor and a joke, but the reality is that policymakers are very well intentioned. They yeah. wanna hear their perspective. And then the, a lot of the people today that have the strategy to come back to, to DC, we call it regulatory capture. So they're experts in this, key, this field. So there are many tactics. What does regulatory capture mean? It's, it's essentially, you know, often uh, referred to as the practice of, you know, there is something happening in the policy conversation. There is a new technology, regulators want to regulate. Those with access can tee up the conversation in order to create market opportunities or remove market barriers. And it's not just direct funding. If you look at the appropriations, it's just shaping so the technology capture, controls. Tied to market share, business outcome. Yes, okay. yes. And you know, we I think that the foundations of it is just 
democratizing access to policy expertise and the idea of coming together and the tactics, which are many in the playbooks, right? The comments creation, uh, meetings, there are many tactics. It's a little bit like in cybersecurity, in order to protect an environment, you have to deploy many tools. The more you simplify the access to that and scale what you can do and automate while having the best experts involved, the better you are. And crowdsourcing, right, integration, having many tools. That's the similar approach that we're trying to take to in policy. And really, it's also about the entrepreneurs shaping up. You know, I t I sh showing up. I t speak with companies that yes. sell to the federal market. <laughs> they sell to the government. Yes. And they don't have government affairs, meaning they don't know what's going to be the future set of uh, guidelines relevant to the customer. It's a go-to-market opportunity for Absolutely. every company. It's interesting. I love chatting with you because, one, you're awesome and you're very knowledgeable uh, in this area. And this is an area that we all have to get better at. And uh, and I love the intellectual, you know, intoxication of policy meets tech because you can imagine all the action that's going to happen. Um, and if you look at like DC, for instance, let's just say I want to influence DC. I'm a company. I can actually get a benefit from DC. So I got to figure out, okay, how do I want to dance with the, my partner, say DC? Now it's funny you bring up cybersecurity because if you look at cybersecurity, one of the best things that's happened with cybersecurity, if you want to see a silver lining, is everyone in the cyber community realizes that they're in it together. It's a mm -hmm. team sport. Two, sharing data is an absolute standard. And three, the playbooks are very instrumental, but you need craft at what you do. Yep. You can't just follow the playbook. There's no mechanism. There's mechanisms yep. to guide you and have some function, but the creativity and the craft of executing situational awareness, which is a military construct that applies to cybersecurity, is now kind of coming into this new area where we mm -hmm. need that kind of skill set. That's right. What's your reaction? You're smiling. I see the degree. You know, you're spot on because what we are excited about is not taking something that is very hard and niche and making it easy. That's the big promise of generative AI, making the impossible possible and the hard easy. And here we have this strategy. It's not even just the tactics or getting the meeting. It's the strategy between, you know, you take a product and what do you need to track? How do you comment on? Where are the relationship? All those tactics. And today the expertise is bright people that have been trained in government affairs shops in VC. There are not a lot of us. In each portfolio, there are a couple of hundreds of this, this leading you know, expertise. So you can just imagine the opportunity with foundation models. And it's not just about the tracking and all those different elements that could be productized. It's about this expertise that need to, needs to be unleashed. So it's not just 1% you know, that can afford yeah. the 50 people with the knowledge, yeah. right? And that is the tactics. And I'm, I like the analogy of hackers, good hackers, friendly hackers because there are not many of them. And with all the security tools, we still need their adversarial mindset to help, yeah. you know, uh, help address the bad hackers. And now you're seeing security yeah. companies stamping into their tactics. So it's I like mean, policy hacking. We want to do the same. Yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, the same thing happens. It's about scale and, and access to data and the human driving the action, driving the car, so to speak. All right, so that brings up another cybersecurity uh, angle here is that, okay, what I've noticed, it's not just cyber, but we're seeing with the generative AI data center uh, transition where the, these super clusters, super computing is coming in to the data center. It's being democratized for the, the masses. NVIDIA and everyone's leading the charge, Broadcoms of the world, Dell. So, okay, so we got super computing. If you change just, if you just put the new stack in place without changing the process, you're broken. So back end, front end is happening at the same time. That's right. You got to do both. You can't just say, I'm going to lean on generative AI and then keep the old process and tactics. You have to adjust the tactics and the process mm -hmm. or the stack or technology you're using. Can you share your thoughts on this? Because what process changes on the policy side as generative AI comes down, as these new uh, communities come together, as these coalitions form, start sharing collective intelligence, start looking at detecting and understanding regulations, and then responding and reinvesting. This is a cyber mindset of a SOC. I so, so, yeah. so sharing is key. What is the process? Because, okay, I buy Gen AI, but What's the process? What changes? Another question I love. You know, I think you're going to see a uh, huge, uh, like, exploding area, which is a category that, you know, has been there, but it's going to grow. It's called policy as code. So the approach of I'm going to sit down and let the EU and let the EUA Act play, play out, and in three years I'm going to change the stack, is no longer applicable if we look at the next generation of security and AI. 
regulation. You have to be on top of it now. FTC is already looking at AI violations, right? So things are coming out, standards are coming out. They might be in the proposal stage, almost final. This is the time to implement because those things take time. The process of infusing policy into your production is there that we are most excited about because when we work with some of the best security companies in the world, like Lasso, like Carinium, uh, Hidden Layer, it's not just about um, you know access to policy and what's coming, it's about governance and how you take that into the product. And I think that is the next generation of the value of policy. And we already know security companies that help with compliance and have that knowledge based yeah. already built into the into the you know, environment they're delivering a lot more value into the enterprise. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, policy brought this up earlier. I interviewed around um, clean um, uh, clean tech and also uh, the tech weeks going on. Both things are interesting about sustainability and and and, and policy. It can't be a bolt on. Mm. It can't be bolt on after a trajectory of something's happening. A decision gets made. It's got to be in at ground zero of all decisions, native to the process, mm -hmm. not a bolt on. Yeah. I mean, it feels to me like, tech, oh, I need policy. I'm going to go in D.C., uh, hire someone. And they hire, a, you know, or hire a firm. Yeah. Okay, good first step, but that's not the answer. It's not a bolt-on. It has to that's be right. embedded in the culture, just like thinking about our planet and things of that nature, because we're impacting. Data centers impact the earth. Um, policy will impact the future of a business and also society. And, you know, this is the key point. Embeddedness into the company and bringing what we call government affairs value cannot be achieved if it's just people's time. So you have to have that interwined it. This is where the tech comes in. So once we understand the policy that matters and all the products that are changing within the company, with the SaaS, with the platform, we can continue and contextualize and have that embedded. And this is the piece I'm most excited about because if you talk about policy awareness and tapping into that value of go-to-market through policy, you cannot be just relying on the time that consultants has. You have to have a different way to connect into the organization. That means a platform, that means technology. Okay, Dr. Me, last question. Um, we'll just sit riff on this because it's something that's fun to talk about. Okay, Gen AI is happening. We're gonna see that happening. Um, technology leaders are innovating. We're seeing new things we've never seen before, new category, as Ch Jensen says from NVIDIA. What, what new problems can we solve now, hard problems in policy? that wasn't solvable pre-Gen AI that you see coming? What, what, what's on the table that could be, we could actually crack the code on now that moves the needle? You know, we like to think about ourselves as one of the most interesting use cases because this is about the connective tissue. Like we can continue and drive AI and innovation, but if innovation is not talking into policy, we are missing a key piece that was traditionally, again, very human expert driven, and this is where we have an opportunity. Um, you mean I, like in a professional service, human driven? Yeah, all those things that are really, you know, uh, very foundational to our technology uh, ecosystem, whether it's design in very niche area, if you think about semiconductors, whether it's bringing a lot of data in, whether it's that missing human expertise that's once in, in reach with all the data points, get you to the final product, to the yeah. strategy. I think that is very interesting because you take a game changer capability, like access to policy. And it's the network effects that, okay, you already had an amazing company, amazing innovation. They were just not in the conversation. And you, you know, bring their capabi that yeah. capability and it's a game changer. Yeah. Um, and I also am excited about the other side, which is policymakers and government are starting to use AI to better understand the sentiments and connect it to what is happening in the innovation layer. And that is important as so well. So really speed, access, scale, and results our yeah. problems that we can solve faster. Yeah, and I, I, I'm excited about taking areas that are human expertise, very expensive, very undemocratized, and putting that together with the data moot and with the network effects of, you know, uh, product. And, um, you know, we like to say that it's that 1% that really matters. And I think, you know, for us, uh, the, 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 for me, the, the, my passion towards this project is once you connect innovation to policy, beyond our own innovation, small innovation yeah. and open policy, it's about all those amazing leaders yeah. and what they can bring to the policy conversation. So Magic. it's really democratizing democracy. The magic happens. Exactly. That's, that's the melting pot. 
Um, I guess we do have one more question since you're here. Um, UN has been in town here in New York City. That's right. It's Climate Week as well. A lot of content coming in. And AI Week. AI is a conversation. AI, we're at the nexus at this point in time. It's a very historic moment. At least in my lifetime, I've never seen this much real opportunity to change fundamental uh, systems while maintaining our shared values in the world and our society as a free society here uh, in the U.S. What have you learned this week so far? I know we're kind of in day three, I think, or two or three. Uh, what, what kind of conversations have you had here in New York City around the globalization? Obviously, the president of the UN, the EU was here earlier. Uh, we saw her. We got the uh, the, uh, the whales are here. Um, Argentina was here on Monday. What are you I hearing? What are you, what sort of the conversations are you having? What's the sentiment? What's the vibe? Yeah. So again, from our, of course, there are many things we can discuss. But, but I think uh, we see a commitment to responsible AI and AI governance. Of course, this is predictable, uh, but I think it's important to reinforce. And so this is where regulation is not an inhibitor for innovation necessarily yes we have to be careful but it's actually a driver for innovation this is where you have those amazing ai governance ai security coming in helping organization to yes deploy ai but also do this in a way that is trusted so that's exciting the sentiment that i'm hearing and i heard this yesterday is uh wow you know uh we want to get connected with those entrepreneurial companies and not all of them have tech diplomacy in our states. <laughs> Guess sure. what? They don't have a dedicated, well, you know, em ambassador. They are out there in the valley yeah. building the companies. And, you know, one thing we should think about is we have to make sure that engagement is not just relying, reliant on in-person conversation. Yeah. We are no longer at, you know, the stage of the police in Rome where, you know, we should expect all these entrepreneurs and developers to walk into right, the, the House of the Legislators in talk. Right. And policymakers have done a tremendous job in trying to expand, in coming to the Valley and trying to get that conversation more open, but there is more to be done and we are excited to be a small piece. So let's talk about open policy. We'll give you a chance to give a plug to the company, but first, obviously you've got a great service. I'm sure you've got a lot of customers with big deep pockets, like the big tech companies, the big tech. Um, but let's talk about small tech. Let's talk about the entrepreneurs yep. around the world not only Silicon Valley in New York and everywhere else, um, they don't have deep pockets and they don't have time because they're building their business. Mm -hmm. Is there a movement around funding from other sources to bring your services to startups? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we have not explored that yet because we were kind of, uh, you know, trying to get our cost into a way that actually Saint and Series A and, and growth companies can afford it. Uh, I think there is a lot of opportunity in that as well. Uh, because, you know, I do think that policymakers need to recognize that those entrepreneurial companies are at the leading innovation, right? Just naturally, they're more innovative, right? Because they're there at this stage. You know, that's why we call it venture capital. But also, they don't have the in-house experts. So, you know, we need more support to make sure that those folks are empowered and have the tools. So that's something to explore. If you're watching out there and you're a nonprofit or you have want to move the needle, uh, get involved with open policy, get them some cash to help the startup. Because, you know, I was just talking to an entrepreneur. He's, I'm too busy. I'm, they're building their company. Yeah. And the, but they want also protection, I guess it's protection, but, but also help to be built in from day one. So mm -hmm. I think folks should fund that. All right, put a plug in for the company, open policy. I love the mission, um, shared values with the cube. We believe in open network effects. We believe in the dual business model of professional service and platform, mm -hmm. which you're doing, I think, very innovative. Uh, how you're executing that. So take take a minute to put a plug in for the company. Yeah, you know, I've been talking about the company all the time. So first of all, uh, vision of me and uh, my co-founder, David Uzan, who is the CTO. Uh, our team continues to grow. Uh, we are very fortunate to be added at a year and already achieving, uh, you know, really great business results. We work with some of the best cyber companies in the world in AI. Uh, really what we are is an end-to-end -end government uh, affairs offering, uh, right, on a platform. And the idea is, if you're a cyber company, you're an AI company, you are impacted by policy. If you don't have enough policy experts, maybe you have one or two and you want to scale, uh, we have the SaaS, the coalition, and the, yeah. um, you know, the network effects to do it. So we'd love uh, for more and more innovative companies to join our ecosystem. And um, you know, uh, I think it is a message about empowerment. It's also a message about understanding that the policy conversation is no longer five years in the making. You know, we are seeing, you talked about NIST, yeah. things coming in and out in three months Straight cycle. Fast. So if you're investing in marketing, yeah. you know, I think it's very important it's to be It's accelerated too, it impacts product roadmap, but ultimately impacts sales. So if you're a business out there, this is going to impact your bottom line. Um, 
fast environment. It's the pace of play, as they say, is pretty high right now. Congratulations, great to have you thank back. Thank you, on the thank team. you. And congratulations, and we love your mission. Again, open policy, really changing the game. It's the new formula uh, in the modern era, openness, network effects, but also coalition and collaboration. That's community. Of course, this is the cube. We believe in the community. We're here in the New York Stock Exchange, opening up our East Coast studios here on the floor of the NYSE. I'm John Furrier, host of the Cube. Thanks for watching.